Hello, my name is David Mitton. I'm the founder of Artjet. And today I'm going to be talking you through lessons learned running WebAssembly in a production with Go and Wazero. So to give you a bit of context, Artjet is a security SDK that developers integrate into their applications to build bot protection, rate limiting, email validation, data redaction, and other security type functionality. The core part of the product is embedded into your application and analyzes every single request that comes through that application. Sometimes it's in the middleware, sometimes it's in API routes, but it's integrated across the entire application. And it's supported on various cross-platform environments. So Node.js, Bun, and Dino uh, is in our initial JavaScript library, but we're also building out SDKs for Python and Ruby. Now, we write everything in Rust and then compile it to WebAssembly, which has been a great technology to work with. It gives us a secure sandbox, which is perfect for a security use case. And that allows us to achieve near native speed when we're analyzing arbitrary HTTP requests, which can be potentially dangerous. And a great advantage with WebAssembly is it's consistent across platforms. So we can run it in JavaScript environments. We're building out for Python environments. And as I'm going to talk about in this talk, we're also running it in Go server side. Now we've picked Go for our decision API, which connects to the SDK to provide it with additional analysis for a number of reasons. The first of these is, it's just the best language and tool chain to build web APIs, particularly when it comes to gRPC, which is the underlying framework we're using because we have some very strict performance requirements and want to achieve as low latency as possible. Now, our goal is to analyze the request within the developer's production environment and to take a decision there where possible. But in many cases, we need to supplement that decision with further analysis on the server. And so that's why it's connecting to our API. And because it's in the hot path, it needs to be as fast as possible. And then just a simple reason that my background is in Go and I have the most production knowledge of running Go APIs. But we write our core analysis functionality in Rust because when we compile it to WebAssembly, we don't want to be bundling in Go's garbage collection, for instance. Rust doesn't have that, and so we're able to maximize the performance. And Rust just has a, a more mature, what I call a leading tool chain for WebAssembly. There are other languages that allow you to compile to WebAssembly, but Rust has been doing it the longest and has the most mature tool chain. So in this talk, I'm going to talk through a few of the lessons that we've learned from running production WebAssembly in Go over the last few months. Now, in particular, we started with some challenges around embedding WebAssembly modules into Go. We're going to talk around how we've optimized the startup times, which are important in different contexts, depending on what you require from a long running server versus a serverless environment, for instance. We've also done some work optimizing performance by doing pre-initialization with Wiser and also with Wasmot. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges around observability and the limitations of profiling with WebAssembly at the moment. Now, in our build process, we transform our WebAssembly definitions into native Go bindings so that we can call them has functions from within Go. Now, our initial approach here was to embed the WebAssembly binaries directly into the Go files, just as large hex encoded byte arrays. The principle behind this was that we wanted to keep those binaries self-contained within the bindings, because that would just simplify management of the code and generally follows the convention that you shouldn't really commit binary files to source control. But this caused us a couple of problems. First of these was 
just with our code editor with VS Code, the Go extension struggled with these larger files. And we saw whilst we were building, whilst we were writing the code, it would often slow down or crash. And that hindered our development workflow. And then we also had some version control challenges. You may have um, seen um, the diff view when you're creating uh, GitHub pull requests. Uh, if you have lots of changes to a file, we have large files, then Go just won't load those diffs. And in some cases, you can click to load them. Once you get over a certain size, it just refuses to render them. And so to address these problems, we switch to using Go Embed, which is built into Go and allows you to embed WebAssembly binary files much more efficiently. And so this solved the challenge that we had with editor performance and it made code reviews a lot more manageable. This also was despite the conventional wisdom and allowed us to improve our overall development experience. Well, startup times can be a problem depending on your context. So in our case, we are loading the WebAssembly on our server, and the server's only starting up once every so often. When we start up a new container, it takes a few seconds to load up the WebAssembly. That's less of a problem for us because we're not accepting traffic whilst the server is starting up. And so by making that trade-off, we can use the compiled module type in Wazira, which compiles the WebAssembly into machine code ahead of time. And that gives you native performance at runtime. And according to their documentation, that is significantly faster than using interpreted code, often by an order of magnitude or more. This is a really important trade-off for us because API performance is a key metric. Our current P50 response time is 10 milliseconds, and we aim for a P99 of 30 milliseconds. This is because we sit in the hot path and we need to return a security decision back to the SDK as quickly as possible. And so we can use this pre-compilation as an optimization because we don't want to have to be recompiling the WebAssembly on every single request. And so when our Go server starts, we execute this compile step for each of the WebAssembly components, which takes a couple of seconds quite slow, but it's the trade-off for that additional runtime performance. And we also made this optimization as part of our test suite. So rather than considering each test completely isolated as you might normally do, we recompile the WebAssembly module at the start of the test runner so that that is available to all of the relevant tests. So you need to make sure that you don't have any interference between the tests, but that means that you don't have the tests or each taking a very long time because they're each doing this compilation step. And we also implemented some pre-initialization using Wiser, which is a tool that's provided as part of the open source community from the Bytecode Alliance. Now we integrated this into our build process because it allows us to reinitialize and pre-compile the WebAssembly modules ahead of time. So there's three steps here. There's the pre-initialization. This instantiates the WebAssembly module and executes all of the initialization functions. It's basically part of the startup process. Then it snapshots that initialized state and it dumps it into a new WebAssembly module. And then the final step is to pre-compile that new module during the build process. Uh, by doing that, it allows us to eliminate the need to compile WebAssembly modules at runtime. It's something that we do ahead of time so that we don't have to do it when we're starting up the server and kind of allows us to ship this initial state ready to go. Now, we also use a tool chain called WASMopt, and we run this over the generated WebAssembly bindings to apply additional optimizations as part of our build process. There's a guide on the WASMopt GitHub wiki that explains the different optimizations, and our team went through various iterations, trying out the different options to see how they would affect binary size, 
or performance. And this is the trade-off that you need to make between the two. So for our SDKs that developers are installing into their applications, we want to minimize the binary size. We don't want to ship huge SDKs and the startup time, just having to load them from disk, it's important to minimize that because some of our customers run in serverless environments where there's a cold start. Every cold start would have to load the binary from disk and the larger the binary file, the slower that process is. This is less of a problem for classic Node.js Express servers, for instance, where we can balance that binary size versus performance. But we still don't want to have a huge startup time, and so we're trying to balance those two. And then for our own servers, where we're less concerned about the startup time because we can optimize for performance instead and just wait for the server to start up before we send traffic there. Now, there are quite a few options to choose from, but we've settled on a few different flags that we set as part of our process where we are running optimizations repeatedly until uh, the program is no longer changing, which is what the converge flag is for, then flatten and re-reloop flattens the internal representation and rewrites the control flow graph. Then the OZ op option applies optimizations um, for size rather than speed. And so this is where you can start to pick what things you want to trade off depending on what runtime assumptions you have. And then GUFA runs optimization against garbage collection. And then finally, we run um, OZ again to clean up the changes that have been made as part of the internal representation. Now, the main downside here is that this produces longer build times. And so we have to trade that off against for how many times are we building our WebAssembly. This doesn't happen that often. Um, part of our deploy process or when we're releasing the new version of the SDK. So it's a cost that we're willing to pay to get much better runtime performance. And so our final, the final build steps that we have are that we have cargo build and we use the WASM32 unknown target. Then we run Wiser and then we run WASM opt and that gives us the end binary that we distribute to our server and also as part of the SDK. Now the final lesson from running WebAssembly in production is just the challenges around profiling. None of the normal performance tracing tools we use can inspect WebAssembly as it's running. We use open telemetry, and so all we can see is the top level Go function call. You can see in this screenshot that we have several different calls into WebAssembly modules. We have a fingerprint generate function, which is WebAssembly. We have bot v2 underscore rule dot rule, which is analyzing the rule configuration. And then we have bot v2 underscore rule dot protect. These are the calls into WebAssembly, and all we can see is the name of the function from Go in our bindings. Now, a workaround here is to scatter open telemetry spans throughout your bindings, uh, but you still can't see exactly what's going on inside the WebAssembly itself. All you can see is the entry and exit from the WebAssembly functions. There's a new tool called WZProf, which looks pretty, prof uh, pretty promising. And that seems to be built on top of Wazero. Um, we haven't tried it out yet because the performance that we get, as you can see from this trace, is well within our latency goals. And so we've just not needed to explore it yet. But I'm looking forward to seeing more observability tools for WebAssembly in the future. So in conclusion, by rethinking how we have embedded WebAssembly modules, we've improved our development workflow and the code maintainability. We've optimized startup times through pre-compilation with Wiser and have applied certain performance enhancements with Wasmopt, which have allowed us to hit our latency goals. These tools have allowed us to build out production quality services using WebAssembly, and it's great that the community is producing these. We have some of our own contributions planned in the near future, so we can start giving back as well. And 
it's great that we've been able to use WebAssembly, which when building a new startup like ArtJet um, was a, a bet on a new technology where we, where we chose to spend our innovation tokens. And so it's been great to be able to see that pay off. We write regularly about our use of WebAssembly on the ArtJet blog. And if you have any questions, then feel free to send me an email. Thanks for watching.